Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, very interesting dis debates and a really interesting issue with a, fi uh, a wide range of of different uh, uh, perspectives on 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 s uh, the challenges facing South Sudan. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about uh, the article that uh, my colleague and I, Sean uh, Healy, and myself wrote. Um, which really uh, is part of a bigger project commissioned by uh, the MSF Executive Committee looking at emergency response um, and the humanitarian aid system. And basically, our, uh, the view from MSF is that actually we're seeing, uh, not only in South Sudan, but also in a wider way, um, actually some real serious failures in emergency response. So South Sudan and the Maban uh, emergency uh, from last year was really our first case study and we're going to be doing a few more. So our focus really was on the period of April till July last year when uh, approximately 110,000 refugees crossed from Blue Nile State into Maban County which is an Upper Nile State. It's a very isolated area um, on a flood plain uh, with only a small sparse population um, and very little in terms of governance. Um, it's a very rural, rural place. There's virtually no um, uh, local people who, with any kind of capacity, um, and no real local economy or local market. So that meant that the refugees that came were entirely dependent on humanitarian assistance. Um, and what we found, I mean, our big conclusion was really that um, you know, the humanitarian system was un unable to stop um, or to mitigate these very high mortality ra rates that lasted really for, for weeks. And subsequently, uh, there was also a hepatitis E outbreak, and which has continued uh, with various peaks. It, it's on the wane at the moment, but we're definitely not uh, out of the woods yet. Um, so we looked a little bit about why that was, um, and parts, of course, uh, can be uh, can be uh, attributed to the very high cost and the logistics uh, required to mount such an operation. I mean, MSF itself, we had two airplanes uh, going twice a week. So if we missed, uh, you know, if we got the wrong spare part, we could just ship it in the next uh, airplane. But for many of the smaller actors, it was really difficult to operate at this scale. Um, so one of the, the ways that the, the, this action was organized, because this was a refugee <coughs> operation, it meant that actually the normal system, uh, uh, normal, <laughs> the regular system, I guess, uh, in place with the cluster um, uh, or the, the NGO sector organized in the clusters um, wasn't put into operation, and it was UNHCR that led the operation. And they set up a kind of alternative cluster system with their own technical sector leads. So they had a wash sec uh, coordination mechanism and, a, and a health and so on. Um, at the same time, UNHCR was a donor and commissioning NGOs to take over different parts of the operation. And that actually created, in some cases, a kind of conflict of interest, where and UNHCR was at one the donor, but also the coordinator. And many of the NGOs uh, reported to us when we did the study that, uh, in fact, they felt that somehow inhibited also to pass up the chain uh, uh, bad, bad news or, or uh, failings on, the, on, on their part. Um, in general, also, the NGOs uh, sector struggled uh, to scale up. Um, they found that they were very, um, uh, they, they admitted to over-promising and under-delivering. Um, there was a lot of pressure from UNHCR, I think, to show that they could handle it and they were on the ball um, in a very difficult circumstance. I mean, at the same time, you know, it was raining, it was muddy, it was very, very difficult. Um, and there were many more refugees than had been foreseen. Um, MSF's own response was quite massive. At a certain stage, we had, I think, 270 expats uh, in place. And uh, we really focused on health, um, focusing on, on clinics and hospitals within the, uh, within the camps. 
Uh, this was also critiqued, um, our own operation was critiqued for being too hospital-centric and maybe not doing enough uh, decentralized health care at the early stages. Um, but we also had a pretty serious investment in water and sanitation. Um, water was the big problem in this, uh, in this response, uh, in particular water supply. And in fact, we, uh, our analysis is that actually uh, the high mortality rates were due to the failures in, in, in supplying sufficient water. Um, and uh, what MSF's approach was, I mean, in some of the camps we actually provided up to 50% of water services, but in other places because uh, the allocation to different NGOs was, uh, you know, the different NGOs had been allocated different water service responsibilities, uh, we had a sort of wait and see approach, which was to s wait and see whether they, these NGOs could actually do the job, and if not, we would step in with our own uh, equipment. And that also was an internal debate within MSF, whether this was a kind of lose-lose uh, <laughs> proposal in that inevitably we would be late and you know for the population it's 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 not the ideal way of working um, so those are some of the systemic issues that that uh, comp I think really affected the response um, in general also we felt that um, one of the outcomes of this response was that uh, there was a kind of patchwork of services. So we had, you had NGOs providing uh, uh, maternity clinics from nine to five, for example. So if you delivered out of hours, you'd have to find some other solution. Or um, you know, part services, the uh, sharing different uh, sectors in one camp to two NGOs, so with different ways of working and different actions. So this patchwork of services was also really quite incomplete, we felt. Um, and overall, we felt there was a lack of contingency planning and leadership within the sector, um, in particular of, of UNHCR at the Juba level. Um, Juba level meetings tended to somehow replicate Maban level meetings with a lot of detail and a lot of discussion around numbers. Uh, but without really a kind of vision of, you know, basic things like location of the camps um, or, you know, what to do when, uh, in contingency planning for, for another wave. Um, so these kind of strategic uh, decisions were, were never very clear and were not, were, were in some cases sort of interpreted differently by different actors. Um, so MSF took a very uh, strong role in terms of advocacy and lobbying. Um, we even had a sort of strategy of advocacy for our peers within the sector. Um, some critiqued us for being very actually kind of overly critical and not solution oriented. Um, and certainly we even internally saw ourselves as being quite aggressive in our, in our stance. Um, we also did some of our lobbying uh, through the media. There was a Channel 4 report, you might have seen it at the time, um, where we were very critical of the current state, of, in particular of Jamam camp, where people were living in the mud with no uh, shelter. So there was, it was effective in some way, but you know, at what cost? Certainly one uh, person I interviewed from an inter NGO said to me it was the, the atmosphere and the coordination meetings was uh, very tense. And um, so we have this, this uh, thing. Um, and the, the other, I guess, wider point for MSF is that it's a bit bigger interrogation uh, that we are doing ourselves is about our role within the humanitarian system. We are somehow an insider deeply involved in the running of camps, in providing basic services. We're a huge actor, particularly in health, and uh, incontournable, as, as you say in French, you can't get around us. But at the same time, we're also a bit of an out outsider um, and uh, not always understanding how the structure of the system is and often uh, interrogating it. Um, so I'll just conclude maybe by saying that, I mean, for us, this, what, what was really a kind of classic 
emergency, uh, the, the typical one. There's almost nothing modern about it. There's no urban, no, uh, uh, you know, uh, no real access problems in terms of, uh, you know, acceptance. This is a, a really classic emergency refugee situation in a, in a rural area. The government was actually very accommodating at the time and, and almost not present. Um, so agencies could just do as they as they thought best. Um, and, and we were still unable to really save lives uh, in a timely, uh, save the lives that should have been saved and, and also respond in a timely way. So although the bigger discussions, and, and this I'll make the loop back to the uh, Toby's first intervention, um, although you know there is a push, of course, for looking to the future and engaging in more development activities, we really feel that at MSF that this shouldn't come at the cost of the improving the humanitarian response. Um, humanitarian response is not easy, and it shouldn't be a given. Um, these basics are still missing, and people are still dying because of it. Thank you very much, Sandrine, and um, I mean, thanks for your analysis, I think, of the earlier phases of the refugee crisis, but also a very candid reflection on the role of MSF itself. I actually remember last year bumping into a bunch of, uh, of colleagues coming out of Maban and being struck by how exhausted they looked, but also this sense of frustration and, you know, inability to, to face um, an emergency that, you know, they felt um, they were inadequate to, to cope with. Um, so, yeah, it resonates very strongly. I'd now like to open um, the discussion. Um, please, you know, if you take the floor, um, say who you are and if you represent an organization. I'd also like to invite our online audience to submit their questions through either the uh, Twitter feed or uh, um, via the web chat at the bottom of the live streaming. Um, who'd like to start? <coughs> 